Scumpi oameni, bun venit în cadrul emisiunii Esențe Spirituale. Suntem la un nou episod, de data aceasta avem un alt invitat, însă vom încerca să atingem aceeași esență duhovnicească de care avem cu toții nevoie. În ocazia aceasta, invitatul nostru va fi Artur Ștele. Dumnealui este un pastor și administrator cu experiență bogată și ca președinte de universitate sau de diviziune și care în ultimii 10 ani a slujit ca vicepreședinte general al Bisericii Mondiale a Adventiștilor de ziua șaptea. Vom încerca să explorăm aspectele cele mai importante și relevante pentru viața de zi cu zi a unui târnă, tânăr sau a unui adult, a unui bărbat sau a unei femei pentru a a ne conecta la Dumnezeu și, dincolo de forme religioase sau de litera legii, să găsim esența de suflet pentru a ne încadra în planul lui Dumnezeu și a avea o viață din belșug cu adevărat. Sunt Cristi Trenchea și în câteva momente vom intra în legătură video cu pastorul Artur Ștele. Rămâneți cu noi în cadrul emisiunii Esențe Spirituale. Elder Arthur Stelle, welcome to Romania, welcome to Spiritual Essence. Thank you, good to be with you. It is a privilege for us to have you here and we thank you for your time and God bless your message and your words. Thank you. Now, we, we know you as a general vice president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And first of all, I'd like to ask you about the duties that Um, a leader in the World Church in this position would have. You've been um, Vice President for 10 years. Please tell us what are the duties? What do you do as a leader in the World Church? Well, there are many assignments that uh, each Vice President has. In my case, um, I'm working very closely and functioning as an advisor to the <clears throat> Biblical Research Institute, to the uh, Geoscience Research Institute, to Andrews University, and to many, many more different committees and so on. So uh, one of the major assignments that I have is to organize international Bible and mission conferences around the world, and be conducting approximately between uh, 12 and 17 each year. Now with the pandemic, we are trying to move from uh, in-person Bible conferences to a Zoom conferences, and we'll see how it uh, will work. But when we look back in these 10 years, uh, the biggest assignment that I had was, you know, to chair the committee on the uh, fundamental beliefs of the church, you know, on issues like abortion, transgender, like uh, woman ordination and stuff like that. They took a lot of time. But the most joyful assignment, it is Bible conferences. Thank you. Thank you. May God bless your work. It's tremendous. Please tell us now things about your life. Before we begin with uh, uh, biblical questions about God, about salvation, we'd like to, to know you as a person a little bit. Tell us about your family tree, about uh, place of birth, about the current family members, please. I was born. I was born to a German family uh, in the country of Kazakhstan. You know, uh, there was a settlement, or a, a German settlement in Kazakhstan. So I was born there. But my father was a missionary, a pastor, and uh, we had to move. You know, uh, from time to time. Actually, uh, sometimes we here were living only six months in one place. Sometimes two years, and so on. So I had to change nine schools while studying because we were moving from one stunt country to another. And so I'm acquainted with all of the stunt countries more than uh, with any other country, probably. Um, uh, then later, you know, when Gorbachev came to power, he allowed Germans to move back to Germany, and most of my family returned back to Germany. Uh, right now, um, my, uh, my parents are still alive, and I'm praying for their health. Um, I have a brother and a sister. Um, my own family, I have uh, one wife, one son, one daughter-in-law, and one grandson. <laughs> God, God bless them. 
Um, did you have a lot of furniture when you moved so many times? Was it difficult? Because w when we move here in Romania from place to place, it's kind of a burden. You said you, you moved a lot of times when you were a child. How do you remember that moving? I remember that uh, what we have done, every time we moved, my father had ordered a metal container uh, that was five tons, you know, probably, I would say, um, four meters by four, something like this. And we had to disassemble everything and pack there. So we tried to keep only furniture as much as would fit in this container. <laughs> Interesting and difficult times. So a German born in Kazakhstan, lived in a lot of Stan countries, uh, lived in Russia, United States. What languages do you speak? Well, uh, to, t to tell you the truth, unfortunately, I don't speak even one perfect. <laughs> but I mostly, uh, for my presentations and uh, preaching purposes, I use English, German, and Russian. Uh, some other languages I know a little bit, but they are not good enough. And I also had to study some ancient languages to study the Bible. But these are old, dead languages. They are not used for talking or communicating, but they are very helpful when I study the scriptures. That's right. That's right. I, I'd like to, t to say something to the audience before the next question. Um, when I was talking to you and I, when I was asking you questions, I, I saw that your, your way of answering was Christ-like. I mean, I was asking questions and you were answering by telling stories. And I must admit, I, I got the point better that way. So please, tell us how was your school and the challenges you had in the school with the Sabbath keeping? Because we know that before the Soviet Union collapsed, um, it, was, it was hard to keep the Sabbath during the schools. Now, how, how do you remember those days and what's your personal testimony about it? Well, it was a very interesting time and a difficult time at the same time because, you know, uh, in the school, every level, uh, like, like, like the first grade, you have to be the follower of Lenin, so to speak, and you had to have a sign, a picture of Lenin on your heart always. Then later on, you had to have a special, you know, on your neck, symbol of Leninism. And then later on in the uh, upper classes in the school, you had to have a special sign to be a follower of Lenin and so on. And of course, as a believer, I could not follow it. And so whenever I would come, doesn't matter what the grade, the first, the fifth, the sixth, and so on, uh, people would immediately see, I don't have a Lenin on my heart, I don't have him on my neck, I don't have on my clothes. And so the first question would be asked immediately, why don't you wear it? And I would respond, because I believe in God. And so uh, you would never be able to hide, it was always obvious. And uh, since uh, we moved from one place to another very often, I had to change many schools. There were all kinds of different experiences. Some teachers were uh, more or less, you know, merciful, so to say, and were tolerable, they tolerated me. But some others did not do it. And I remember very well when uh, some uh, teachers were trying, you know, to encourage my colleagues, uh, students, to beat me up. And uh, uh, so that I would, you know, stop believing in God and start wearing the sign of Lenin. And I remember when I was finishing the school, my head teacher told me, if you don't uh, stop, you know, your crazy religious ideas and start wearing the sign of Lenin, I will give you such an evaluation that you will have no possibilities to study in any college, university, even in the prison, they will think twice to take you or not to take you. And so the teacher kept her word. And when I finished the school, I got the evaluation. And it was a terrible evaluation. She presented me like a terrorist. And so I remember when I brought this evaluation home, my mom saw it, she read it, and she started to cry. And so I shredded it in pieces and threw it in the uh, toilet. <laughs> so this was the end of it. And uh, I also thought I will never be able to study anywhere in the school, in I mean in college or university, because they all required e evaluation. And one day I remember my father was coming home 
and having a newspapers in his hand, and he asked me, did you see what is here? So I looked and there was an um, advertisement of the medical school, medical college for pharmaceutical department. And it was stated they accept only based on entrance exam and GPA from school. So no evaluation form was required. And so although I never liked to be in medicine, never liked pharmacy, I had no choice. So I decided I will try. So you, so didn't, you didn't intend to, to follow the, the medical career. You didn't intend that, but that was the, the only open door. Exactly. Uh, and you know, they did not require evaluation form because uh, only girls were studying there and normally they behaved nicely, so they were not required. <laughs> and so I entered and I studied uh, in the pharmacy first, but it helped me tremendously later when I was serving in the military, actually saved my life. But later on, times have changed, and I had the opportunity to study theology in Germany and then in the United States, and uh, uh, the Lord has blessed me abundantly later on. But this was a very interesting experience. Yeah, and uh, the experiences from the beginning of our life, uh, they are unforgettable. Well, right. um, so when you were a teenager back in school, what was your your worst day at school, and what was your best day during the week? We're talking about the Soviet Union time, you know, atheism, communism, and the challenges. Did you have, because in Romania, people uh, lived a similar, a similar life. This is why I, I'm asking you this. What was your best day and worst day in the week? Well, uh, it's uh, difficult to say because uh, one difficult day was always a Monday, because you come and the teacher will tell you, you know, on Sabbath you didn't come to work to do, we were all working and you was not here. And so I had to, you know, explain why I didn't work on Sabbath. So Monday was bad because always I had to, you know, somehow respond to all these uh, questions and uh, brainwashing that they were doing. And the best day was Tuesday, because it was still till the weekend quite a bit, and yet the old one was over. And so it was more or less one of the most favorable days. Favorable. Thank you, thank you. Um, what would you say to a teenager, like you were back then, to help him get closer to God? And I'm giving you one Bible verse, John chapter 12, verse 21, where it is written that some people came to the disciples and said, Sir, we'd like to see Jesus. We would like to, to see our friends coming to us saying these words. We'd like to see Jesus. But that doesn't happen too, too often. What can we do to help them get the, the point of a meaningful Christian life and to to be willing to get through these challenges and to find the joy, the pleasure, and the, you know, Christ and eternal life. How can we help a teenager to get closer to God? Uh, I think one of the first principles is not to push teenagers, you know, uh, even to the right way. Whenever you push someone, you uh, really... Uh, uh, don't help. You, you can only love out of the world the teenagers. You cannot push them out of the world. So this is, is the key. Because when you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus was, you know, loving, caring, and he was trying to save those that the society has already forgotten. And he was spending time with those who were drunk, with those who have, uh, you know, terrible lives. But he showed them the love of God. And this love of God was, uh, you know, functioning like a virus because people were looking at it, they were attached to it. And so what we can do today, number one, is not to push uh, people, but to demonstrate the happiness we ourselves are getting from our relationship with Christ. Because when my friends, teenagers, let's say, see me happy, and see me, you know, enjoying Jesus, they will ask themselves. So number one would be, live a life that will attract 
the young people. Very often we say we will push them, we will tell them, you know, we will uh, convince them with the power of argument. It doesn't work for young people because even if you bring a strong argument, they will tell you, so what? How does it change my life? How does it improve my life? And only when we demonstrate in our life the happiness, the fulfillment, and the joy we have in Jesus Christ, this will affect them. I think this is the best way to be witness to them. Thank you so much. And that's, that's the core of, of uh, our show, Spiritual Essence. What difference does it, does it make? Um, how can this change my life? And thank you for your answers. Now, in the next episode, I will ask you about the military service and about the World Church. But for, for the last minute, I will ask you to to sum it up, to boil it down, everything you can think about the faith, personal relationship with the Lord in three keywords. Can you help us with this? You see, uh, when you speak with, uh, about the relationship with God, you have to, you know, some kind, uh, ca uh, some kind of uh, build up this relationship. And because of that, I would say the three words that are really, really important for me. It is reading, you see, it's a verb. <laughs> reading. Reading, communicating or praying, and witnessing. I would say the faith is built on these three words. Reading, studying the Word of God, uh, communicating, discussing, speaking with the Lord like with the Father, and witnessing. And the joy that I get from this relationship to show it to my friends and neighbors. So these three words. Reading, reading, communicating, witnessing. Okay. So listening to him, telling him, and sharing him. Exactly. Yeah, that's... You have even better words. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Until next time, we will pray for you and for the, the leaders of the World Church. Thank you for your time. May God bless you, Brother Stelle. Thank you. Îi mulțumim lui Dumnezeu pentru interviul acesta interesant cu pastorul Arthur Ștele. Ați sesizat accentul dumnealui de neamț, născut în Kazahstan și trăit în, în Rusia pentru multă vreme. Esența spirituală din ocazia aceasta se leagă de versetul din Ioan 12 cu 21. Domnule, am vrea să vedem pe Isus și ca oamenii să, să ne spună lucrul acesta E nevoie să trăim în așa fel încât viața noastră, plină de sens, plină de bucurie și de perspectivă, plină de Duhul lui Hristos, să fie atrăgătoare celorlalți, ca să-și dorească să trăiască pe aceeași cărare îngustă, dar unică și atât de frumoasă. Rămân dar aceste trei, spunea pastorul Artur Ștele, Scriptura, rugăciunea și slujirea. Exact ca în sanctuarul poruncit de Dumnezeu, unde pâinea depusă înainte reprezenta hrana, scriptura, unde uh, candelabrul cu lumină reprezenta slujirea, iar altarul tămâierii simboliza rugăciunea. Hristos, cuvântul scris, Hristos, cuvântul întrupat și Domnul Isus Hristos, cuvântul împărtășit. Până data viitoare, fie ca Dumnezeu să vă dea această esență spirituală în suflet. Din studioul Conferinței Moldova, vă mulțumim pentru participare la emisiune. Următoarele episoade le puteți urmări pe site-ul proiectm.ro și așteptăm sugestiile dumneavoastră cât și întrebările pentru invitați pe adresa de mail afișată pe ecran. Până atunci, vă doresc numai de bine!